through. I won't repeat everything uh, that I said during the Sunday school hour, but for those of you who weren't here, uh, literally Tim and I just physically met just a few moments ago, but I've known about him and his reputation for quite a long time. We had a lot of mutual friends uh, when I was a student back in Faith Baptist Bible College in the mid-90s and uh, early 2000s. Uh, got to know probably a lot of his co-workers. We're pretty good friends with the Stillwell family, some of whom we support here at Calvary as well. But they've had a long and fruitful ministry there as a second-generation ministry uh, on the field of Peru. And we are delighted that he is here to tell us uh, about what's happening there in his ministry and to share the Word of God with us. Tim, if you'd come. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I guess I don't need that. I've got my glasses right here. (laughs) Anyway, I must have left my brain in the motel last night. (laughs) All right. Well, let's open our Bibles this morning, please, to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. And then we're going to go from Acts chapter 2 to Acts chapter 7. So if you can have both of those just a little bit handy... Uh, Not Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 17. Sorry about that. If you can have those handy, I do want to read one short passage out of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Okay? Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I am reading out of the King James. um, But if you can follow along, we should do okay. Uh, First... uh, Excuse me, Worf. I tell you, my mind just doesn't work well in English. <laughs> okay, so beginning with verse uh, 1, Acts chapter, or, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. I'm just going to start there, and then we'll go to Acts chapter 2, okay? Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, okay? The gospel, which I preached unto you, which ye also have received, and wherein ye stand, which also, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Okay, so what is the gospel? Verse 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So what is the gospel? That Paul preached. Paul preached the gospel that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Okay? Let me just start by saying that can never change. Do you agree with that? Is that the only gospel? True gospel? That can never change. We don't have the freedom to add to that or distract or, or, or um, I can't even think uh, take away from that <laughs> all right um, that is the gospel that is the gospel we can't fudge on that all right now let's go to Acts chapter 2 so I'm going to give you uh, this morning two godly men who preach the gospel to different crowds okay to very different crowds. And you will notice that the gospel did not change. The gospel was the same in both cases. What changed is how they got there. Okay? What changed is how they got there. The first one is Peter. And in Acts chapter 17, we're going to be looking at Paul. They both got to the same gospel, but they got there from a different direction. All right? Let's pray, and then we'll dig into Acts chapter 2. Dear God, thank you so much for the day. Uh, Thank you, Lord, for this, your church, for these, your people. Thank you, Lord, for uh, your word. I pray that you would use your word in our hearts this morning, that you would be honored and glorified, and that we, Lord, would take the responsibility of sharing the gospel to heart, and that we would all do what we're supposed to do, but help us, Lord, to be sensitive to the people we're speaking to. Lord, I pray that you will give the results in your time and that you would be honored and glorified. I pray for the salvation of people. If there's anybody here this morning that isn't saved and needs to be, I pray that you would save them. 
but use us, Lord, to save people who may not even be here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so let's start with Peter. And the, the, the context here is the day of Pentecost, one of the four big Jewish feasts. And there were thousands of people gathered in Jerusalem that day on the day of Pentecost. Um, and, and most of them were Jews. Maybe not all of them, but most of them were Jews. It does mention in one of the verses that there were strangers from Rome. It's possible that those people were not Jews But most of the people who are there are Jews, but they're from all over the world. Okay, they're from many, many nations. There's a whole list of of languages, of of nations that are listed in verse 9 and 10 and 11. It says Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt and in all parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. So Peter gets up to speak in just a minute, but there were, you know what happened on the day of Pentecost, okay? The Spirit came down and and marvelous things started happening that day. And uh, so marvelous that people, uh, you know, were amazed. Verse 12, they were, they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, what meaneth this? Others, mocking, said, uh, they are, uh, these men are full of new wine. Okay, so um, people were amazed. How is this happening? What in the world is going on? Some people were amazed and wondered what was going on. Others just took it very, you know, they're just drunk. They've been drinking, yeah. These men are full of wine. Well, it was 9 o'clock in the morning when this was happening. So Peter gets up. Okay, in verse 10, but Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words, for these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour. Okay, the third hour would be 9 o'clock in the morning. Okay, so if they're not drunk, what are they? What is going on? And so Peter is going to explain to them what is going on, and he's going to say this, okay? You should already know that. And the reason you should already know what's going on is because you have the Scriptures. You're Jews, you're people who were brought up in the, in the Old Testament Scriptures and in the Law of Moses and in the writings of the prophets. You should know what's going on. You shouldn't need me to explain this to you. You should know what's going on. That's what Peter's going to say. Okay? And so, uh, verse 16. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Okay. You want to know what's going on? Well, let's just remember what Joel said. When he brought up the name of Joel, did they know what he was talking about? Of course they did. These people were brought up in the Jewish traditions. These people were brought up in the law of Moses and in the writings of the, of the Old Testament prophets. And when they said Joel, they might not remember specific passages and things about Joel, but they knew his name, and when he said Joel, there, a, a, a little light bulb went on, and thought, oh, Joel, Joel, yeah, 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 okay, we know what, we know who Joel is. Why don't you remind us what Joel said? And so he does that. And here's what Joel said, and it shall, shall come to pass in the, in the last days, saith God, will, I, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaids I will pour out in, these, in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy and I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke and the, uh, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So that is what Joel said. And so what Peter is saying is the things you have seen today, here in this place, these things are fulfilling what Joel said would happen. And you should have gotten that. You should have gotten that. 
verse 22. You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holding, up, holding of it. What's he doing? What's he talking about now? So he's talking about the gospel. He's talking about the death of Christ. He's talking about the resurrection of Christ. He's talking about the gospel. That didn't change. What he's talking, or who he's talking to is the Jewish people. And they had this information from the Old Testament. They should have known what was happening. And when he starts talking about how they have slain this man named Jesus, they knew what he was talking about because they had just done that not too long before. And so Paul is, or, excuse me, Peter is using the Old Testament to explain what was happening, and he's bringing it around and giving them the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Christ died for their sins according to the scriptures, that he rose again, or that he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. He's explaining that to them. That's what he comes around to, and he uses the Old Testament prophets as a means to get to that message because he was speaking to Jews. He was speaking to people who had brought up, been brought up in the Old Testament prophecies. Verse 24, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death. And then he goes to David, starts talking about David. Did they know who David was? Well, of course they know who David, probably a little more than they knew about Joel. But David, of course, was one of their kings he was long dead by this time but he's talking about david and he uses david to, he says dave david talked dave <laughs> david talked about this david talked about this i have a brother named david and everybody calls him dave for david speaketh concerning him i foresaw the lord always before my face for he is on my right hand and i should not be moved therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad moreover also my flesh my flesh shall rest in hope because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. He's speaking about the Christ. Let's go to, let's go to verse uh, 30. Therefore, being a prophet, knowing that God had sworn an, with an oath to him that the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, where, whereof ye all are witnesses. He's giving them the gospel. The gospel presentation. Now let's go to verse 35. Oh, excuse me, 36. Therefore let all the house of Israel uh, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? That's a really good question. That's a really good question, and they were prepared to make that question because the, the light of the gospel, uh, you know, it just, it, it dawned on them. It clicked. They knew the scriptures. They hadn't put it all together. They knew the Old Testament. They knew the prophets. It, it, it was just a little bit of a scrambled information pool in there. Well, now Peter has put it all together for them, and they go, wow, oh, we get it. Now what are we supposed to do? Now, now what are we supposed to do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, that, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the, promise is made, uh, for, for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward or crooked generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Can you imagine? Was there a harvest? There was a massive harvest. 3,000 people in one day. 
3,000 people. <laughs> wow. And they were baptized. 3,000 people. I, I would have loved to be there. <laughs> okay, forget all the modern conveniences. I wanted to be there. <laughs> that is amazing. And, and what a harvest. The most, pe the, the, the most people I've ever baptized in one day was 12. And that was amazing. I can't imagine 3,000. We were starting the church in Naring, and people had gotten saved, and we programmed a baptism. And so we went out to the stream to baptize, and there was a pool there in the stream, and this stream came right out of a glacier. Literally, right out of a glacier. And I got in that water, and of course they had to get in the water to get baptized, but they just got in, got dunked, and got out. I had to stay there during the 12 people. I turned blue, but I didn't care. Because this was a victorious day. Can you imagine this? 3,000 people, there was a harvest. Why? Because the Old Testament scriptures, even though they hadn't put it all together, even though they, they really didn't believe probably most of it, the information was there, and God used that background preparation for that when when the light came on, it came on. And many, many people got saved. What a harvest. Now let's go to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. Now this is Paul. And Paul is not speaking to Jews, although he did speak to Jews previously in the same chapter. The part we're going to look at, he's not speaking to Jews. He's not in the synagogue. Um, he's speaking to, uh, to Grecians, to Athenians. He's, he's in Athens. Athens is in Greece. And these people are not, are not Jewish. These people are pagans. Okay? These people are pagans. They are religious, but their religion is so scattered that they don't even know who they worship anymore. Okay? They've got all kinds of gods. They've, they've built altars to all these different gods. And they, they had them all there. They were very religious. Very religious people, but they were pagans. Pagans. And one day Paul is walking around in Athens and he sees an altar and the altar, he's looking at all these, he'd seen the other altars, but he noticed one that said an altar to the unknown God. Okay, it's almost like, you know, we got to cover all the bases. So we're going to build an altar to this one, to that one, to that. All these gods, you ever hear another one? Let's put an altar there for, but just in case we missed one, we don't want to make him mad. Okay, just in case we miss some God out there, uh, you know, he might show up. He might see that we're not including him. So let's put an altar for him too, just in case. And so Paul's walking around town and he sees this altar. And then he gets invited to go have a chit chat with the think tank in town. Okay, and so that's where we're going to pick it up. <clears throat> Verse 21, for all Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Okay, so the, 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 the Athenians, there was a group of Athenians that considered themselves to be wise thinkers open-minded we just want to hear new information just, you know whatever it is let's bring it in and let's chat about it let's talk about it let's discuss it let's kind of you know weigh the, uh, the the information to see if it's worthy or if it's not if it's valid or if it's not and so they're all that they do this all the time okay that's all they spent their time doing was talking about all this stuff Verse 22, then Paul stood in the, midst of, in the midst of Mars Hill, in the midst of these people, and said, ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious, or religious is the word. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, 
I found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. So as I was walking around town, folks, I saw this altar. I see that you're very, very religious. And I found this altar that says to the unknown God. And you worship this unknown God. You don't know anything about him. You, you worship him out of your ignorance. Well, guess what? I know him. Do you think he had their attention now? Mm-hmm. I know him. I know. I know him. And I want you to know him too. And so their ears prick up. We built an altar for him. Might as well know who he is. Okay, so how does he get to the gospel now? <laughs> That's his jumping off point. But look at, look at where he starts. Verse 24. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Where does he start? He starts talking about creation. This God that you built that altar to, that you ignorantly worship, well, guess what? He made you. He made you. He's the God of heaven and earth. He made everything you see. He is the creator of everything. And you can't box him up in a little temple made with hands. You can't. You can't, he, he's way, way beyond that. He's infinite. And so don't restrict him to your little pagan religious uh, practices here because he's, he's way bigger than that. Okay, and he goes on in verse, uh, verse 25. Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. He's proving that God really does exist and that he is the one true God who made everything. Every, everything exists uh, by him. You see, the, 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 the Greek gods, the gods that the Greeks worshipped, okay, they, they had power over water and wind and rain and fire and all these things, okay, but they, were, they weren't the creators of any of that. They were part of a creation. Okay, they, they were just specialists in their area of powers. But they had been created. And Paul is saying, this God that you ignor ignorantly worship, he wasn't created, he is the creator. So he is nothing like these gods that you've been worshiping your whole life. Verse 28. For in him we live and move and have our being. As certain also of your own poets have said. For we are also, we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God. We ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone. Graven by art and man's device. He's not a physical. You, you can't make him. You can't depict him. You can't, you, you can't say this is what he looks like. Verse 30, in the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof, whereof he hath given assurance to all men that he hath raised him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked and others said, we will hear of thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them. Did he give them the gospel? Yeah, he gave them the gospel. When he got to the resurrection part, um, some of them were turned off because they weren't in agreement about that. And Paul says, that's fine. And he, he leaves. He leaves. But look, look at verse 34 howbeit certain men clave unto him and believed was there a harvest uh -huh. yeah among the which was Dionysius and uh, uh, the Areopagite I'm not even sure how you say that and a woman named Damaris and others with them was there a harvest yeah it just wasn't 3,000 people there's only two mentioned by name, 
but there were others, there were a few that got saved. Why? Why such a difference? 3,000 people get saved, and now just, you know, a handful get saved. What was the difference? Same gospel. The gospel didn't change. The difference was that they weren't speaking to the same crowd. Paul was not speaking to Jews. Paul was not speaking to a people group that had been raised in the Old Testament scriptures their whole life. They didn't... If, what, would, what would have happened if when Paul gets up there and on, on, there on, in Mars Hill among all these people and if Paul had said, as spoken by the prophet Joel... What would they have gotten it? Would would it have clicked? They had no idea who Joel was. If he'd have mentioned David, they might have known. They probably studied history. They might have known. Oh yeah, David wasn't he one of those kings way back in the history of Israel? But but they wouldn't have had that background preparation, that background knowledge that the Jews had, and so it clicked for them. But these people didn't have that. They were pagans. They had no idea who Jesus was. They had no idea that God really did exist and that he was the creator of everything. They just put an altar up there just in case there's somebody out there that we forgot about. They had no background knowledge. And Paul is sensitive to that and doesn't start talking to them about Joel and David and the prophecies and the law of Moses. He hits them where they are. Now let me ask you this. Where are we today? Our country, the United States, was founded on biblical principles. I'm not saying all our forefathers were believers, okay? But there were enough people back there to know that this book works. And so when they, when they wrote out our constitution and all the ancient documents of this country, there are, it's laced with biblical principles that hold true. Um, and even back then, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have said the United States is a Christian nation, okay? Um, it's certainly not a Christian nation now. Does the United States today look more like the crowd that Peter spoke to? Or do we look more like the crowd that Paul spoke to? And I got to be honest with you, um, we're a little more pagan than a Judeo-Christian society today. Where God has been stomped down and squelched and um, covered up and everything has been done to try to hide, intentionally hide his, his, his existence and his love for us and the death of Christ and you, when you, should we all be sharing the gospel with somebody? Yeah, we should. But when you start, when you open your mouth and start talking to that person, you can't just assume they know what you're talking about. Maybe 50 years ago, they might have had an idea because they still got it in school. But nowadays, you start talking to somebody about Jesus, and they're gonna, you're gonna draw. Some people will will understand. Okay, I, I'm not saying it's everybody. Some people will. Oh yeah, I know, I know about him. But many people will just look like, who? And when you talk about the love of Christ, they've twisted the love of Christ around to where now we hate them. I don't know how you do that kind of mental gymnastics, but but they did it. They've done it. They've twisted everything around. So now if you speak to somebody about Christ, you're doing it because you hate them? Oh, really? But that's the society we live in. So when you sit down in that, 
in that doctor's office in the waiting room next to somebody and you start looking for an occasion to share the gospel with that person, don't just assume he's going to know what you're talking about because he just might not. And we need to be aware of the people that we're talking to and try to figure out where they are because we might have just a few minutes with them or just a, a, a couple of sentences with them. And what you speak in that short time needs to make sense for them. And the gospel isn't going to change. How we share that with people does need to be a little bit flexible according to the people we're speaking to without flexing the content. And I, 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 I don't know if I got that point across, but you can't change the content. You just might have to change your approach to it depending on who you're talking to. Does God still save people? Sure he does. And can he save this current generation of people in our country? Sure he can. And, it, and, and he'll do it in such a way that we know it's him doing it and not us. Um, but he does want to use us and we just need to be ready to speak to the people that we're speaking to. And understand where they're coming from. So let's be faithful in doing that. I want to share with you just testimony of one of the ladies in Kiteni. Um, and her name is Flora. Flora, Flora. You know, Flora. Um, Spanish couple over here. I love speaking Spanish with them before the service. It was amazing. Um, but Flora, uh, she, was, she, she literally lived right across the street from the property we bought. And we moved into one side of that, the house that had two floors. Barbara and I moved in there to have temporary housing while we were doing the building uh, project and all of that. Well, um, Flora was straight across the street from us. And I, I mean, I can't. I, this, there is no exaggeration here at all, okay? She was the meanest person in town. Oh, she was mean. She was really, really. Think of the meanest person you know. She was meaner than that, okay? Um, she just was. Her husband at one time had been the mayor of Kiteni when Kiteni first, they found the, the natural gas in the area and Kiteni started building up. Uh, her husband was elected as, as the mayor of the town, and so she kind of felt entitled to being able to do things that other people couldn't go get away with and uh, demanding things that other people couldn't demand. And, I mean, you know, she had people waiting on her hand and foot because she was the mayor's... The mayor died a few years before, okay? But, but So she was a widow, but she was still entitled by virtue of having been married to this man. And so if, you know, when she went to the market, she didn't have to carry a thing. There were people that did that for her and everybody. And if they carried it wrong and if they dropped something, whammo, she would just smack them. <laughs> All right. I mean, she was that mean. I've seen her use uh, language that made my ears turn red um, in putting men down, especially men. But just awful language, awful person, awful, awful person. She was mean to us. She was mean to Barb, very mean to Barb. But um, just she was just a very, very mean, mean person. And when you'd say hello to her, you know, you'd see her in the morning and say, Buenos dias, señora Flora. She would look at you and she'd go, yeah, yeah. just about like that. Okay? That was no friendliness at all. Everybody else in town was friendly. They didn't know what we were there for, but they were friendly. Um, she was not. Well, the very first night of, of the quarantine, when we went up on our rooftop and looked out, I looked across the street, and the first person I saw, I mean, I'm talking, the street is right here, from here to Pastor and his wife, okay? That's our house and her house, a narrow street in between, and we're two floors up looking across at each other, and I look across, and I say, Señora Flora, buenas noches, and she looks at me, and she says, Señor Timo, buenas noches. First time she was halfway decent in, in greeting me back. And that night I started praying for Flora. 
And when we started having our services on the rooftop and, and, and you know, going out uh, th through a sound system to the whole town, basically, and then we started doing Facebook uh, Live and all of that kind of stuff. But anyway, she never missed a night. She was always up there. Never missed. She was one of the first people who wanted the song sheet so she could sing. She was one of the first people who wanted a copy of the Bible so she could read and, and all of that. And, and Flora was just there all the time, all the time. And I, I started that first night, I, in my heart, I said, Lord, I want to pray for this woman every day. And I started praying for her salvation. Two years later, when we were finally allowed to, well, that, about a little le less than two years later, we were, start, we were meeting up on the roof. By then, we'd built up our second side of the, of the building, and we were up top there, and we were allowed to have services in the open air without a lot of restrictions. Um, and, and so anyway, we were meeting up there, and Pastor Orlando was allowed to come over and do all that. And um, so anyway, he, he, he was just leading the service, and he said one day, okay, folks, well, today we're gonna, I think we're going to start taking an offering again. It's been two years since we took an offering. We're going to take an offering today. And so a couple of the men uh, came forward and helped with the offering and all of that, and we sang something and took the offering, and I heard a knock on the door, and I looked two floors down, and it was Flora. Okay? During the whole service, she'd been over on her rooftop. She never did come over to the service she'd stay and, and a lot of people still stayed on their rooftop listening to the service even though some people were present and so I go running down the stairs I open the door and she says hermano Timo solo estoy trayendo mi ofrenda I'm just bringing my offering and that was a pretty good indication that God was doing something in this woman's life Flora got saved during COVID and just changed so so drastically she'd been very religious before okay and i knew that and so anytime i talked I, I made sure that i that i had in mind what her background had been and i i would preach the word from up on the rooftop and she'd be across the street listening and at some point she finally got saved she got it the light went on and when barb was able to finally talk to her she said oh yeah i've made that decision <laughs> I've made that decision. I've been listening to the preaching, and I've made that decision. I've accepted Christ as my Savior. And immediate change, and everybody in town knew it. Everybody in town knew it. There were people who were hesitant to come to church because, oh, I can't go to church because Flora's there. She might hit me. <laughs> you know? Um, she was just mean enough she might do it, but then somebody else would, would chime in and say, oh, no, she's not the same Flora. She's gotten saved. and She's totally different. People would come in, and they'd, they'd walk in the door, and they'd see her, and they'd hesitate. Flora comes? Yeah. Wow. Um, and they'd go in and kind of hesitantly sit down, and then later on they'd say, oh, wow, what a difference. She was friendly with me. She said hi to me. She was singing. She was reading uh, her Bible. What happened? And that opened doors for us to be able to share the gospel with other people. God did an amazing work. You know what? God is not limited to doing an amazing work in Kiteni. And God is not limited to doing an amazing work through Tim and Barbara Watley. My God is way bigger than that. God can do an amazing work through you. And he wants to. We just need to be faithful in doing what he wants us to do. A few weeks ago, I was at a pastor's retreat, and one of the speakers talked about faith flags. Okay? Faith, pla faith flags that use opportunities to plant a faith flag. What's a faith flag? Well, you know, faith flag, flag is just bringing up the subject of God. Wow, such a beautiful day. It's a really nice day. Yeah, isn't God faithful in how he gave us a beautiful day today? You're planting a faith flag. You plant some faith flags, and those flags will spring up. Um, and God will give you opportunities. They'll open doors. They'll open doors. You, you folks have the unique um, 
privilege of living in Rochester, Minnesota. There are a lot of people who only know Rochester, Minnesota because they've suffered just enough. They're trying to get into the clinic. A lot of suffering people come to this town. And suffering people will listen to a faith flag. They will. So I encourage you to plant some faith flags and look for opportunities because God is not limited to doing amazing things just in Peru. God can do amazing things in Rochester, Minnesota. And he wants to use you to do it because you're the ones that are here. Not us. So be faithful. All right. I think I'm done. And I don't know where Pastor wants to go with this, but <laughs> we'll just end in prayer and dismiss. Okay. And oh, the okay. I'm not going to dismiss. I'll pray and then uh, let somebody else do the dismissing. Sorry. <laughs> All right, let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for your word because your word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And you want to use your word to cut into the lives of people and, and do some spiritual surgery. You've done it in our lives, Lord. At least I'm, I'm confident that you've done it in the lives of most of those who are present today. But you still want to use your word to do some surgery in other people's lives. And Lord, I pray that we would be faithful in being instrumental in doing that. And that we would be able to sit back and give you the glory when we see the results. Because you do give results. You are still all powerful and you are still in the business of saving people. Thank you so much for saving us. Use us as instruments to save others. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.